Welcome to the Microsoft Australia OEM Server Update for November 2015. In this update video we'll be covering off leveraging Windows 10 capabilities with your SMB customers and we'll be covering a variety of different technologies in this recording focusing on some of the different deployment methods, deployment tools and management tools. So I guess one of the good things to start with is we can continue to use a lot of the tools that we're already uh, used to using over the years such as group policy, WDS, uh, deployment toolkit for example. but over the years there have been some enhancements and some changes and as we go through today's recordings hopefully you get some new ideas about some of the new tools and technologies that may make your deployment scenarios uh, and uh, deployment processes a little bit simpler. So let's start off with some of the key reasons why you may want to move your uh, SMB customers across to Windows 10 Pro. I guess one of the most important ones which isn't actually listed on the slide is that for Windows 7 customers upwards they do qualify for a free upgrade to Windows 10 for the next uh, until uh, July 2016. So if we take a look at some of the new things for people who are shy of Windows 8 or 8.1 because of the new start screen well the start menu is back uh, we've got the new browser we've got new universal app capabilities uh, there's uh, enhancements to group policy, there are a bunch of online integration capabilities, business store features, so for those of you looking to do like a curated store for your customers, there'll be some updated uh, capabilities around Windows Update coming in the future. But also, I guess one of the important things just to wrap up with on this slide is, you know, some of the enhancements to security that have been made. Now, some of these secure enhancements have been made uh, since the Windows 8 timeframe, which means that even though some of them may not be new to people who've been using Windows 8 or Windows 8.1, for people who've been on Windows 7, some of these new capabilities around, you know, making sure the OS is protected before it boots, for example, you know, they'll be they will be seen as new features for these customers. But there are other things that we've got in here such as the Windows Hello capabilities, so being able to leverage technology such as infrared cameras to be able to do facial recognition uh, where it effectively has to be a person there signed into the machine, uh, not something where you, you know, the kind of facial recognition that just does pattern matching. Uh, this is something that actually has to detect a person there as well. Now, also important with Windows 10 is its ability to run across a variety of device types from Internet of Things type devices all the way through to large PCs, uh, things like the Surface Hub, as well as, as, well as being the basis for the, the upcoming Microsoft HoloLens product as well. So with the free upgrade, as I mentioned, it's a one-year upgrade process that uh, customers can take advantage of. Now, depending on how you are, uh, you know, how your machine uh, is set up. So if it's connected to a domain, then you shouldn't be uh, presented with the option to upgrade to uh, Windows 10. So that means that for your customers that have got domain joined PCs running Windows 7 or later, they shouldn't get this notification. Instead, it's a process where you grab the ISOs and you can go through and do the updates in a time frame that suits you, as opposed to it being something that uh, the user can go to Windows Update and say update now. So obviously that means that you get more of a chance to test things like hardware and software compatibility but realistically speaking if it's hardware that runs uh, Windows 8 or later or was designed for Windows 8 or later you really shouldn't have too many issues at all when it comes to hardware compatibility and with software compatibility if it's something that you've got running on Windows 7 then again um, you know it will let you know in advance uh, as part of the setup process, if you allow it to set up while it's connected to the internet, it will go through, check for the latest compatibility issues that it's aware of to let you know if there's anything that may need to be uninstalled or anything that uh, may need an update before you do proceed with the upgrade. So these are all things that uh, there's a lot more information on and I recommend that you check some of the blog links that I provide at the end of this recording. Now an important piece of this upgrade is that the upgrade license is tied to the device for the supported lifetime of the device. So it's not an upgrade that applies to the user, it's actually something that relates to the device. Um, so that's just an important distinction here because sometimes people think it's their upgrade when in fact it's actually their computer's update. Now if we take a look at the upgrade paths, we'll talk about some of these in a little bit more detail as we go through. But for the free upgrade path, if we take a look at what we've got here, for the Windows 7 Starter, Home Basic or Home Premium, um, or Windows 8.1 OEM and Retail SKUs, uh, they'll get presented that option via Windows Update uh, 
and of course these machines won't be internet connect sorry won't be domain joined so this is something that they you know these users if they opted in would have been um, presented with Windows 10 upgrade capabilities uh, right from the beginning now part of this process is that uh, no product key is required if the machines are doing an in-place upgrade uh, just to try to keep things a bit simpler for you now, as you go through the list of the different supported upgrade methods, you'll see that there are things such as the clean install, there are in-place upgrades, and we'll talk about those in more detail as we go through uh, the rest of the presentation. So, let's start off now, and we'll focus on the deployment choices. So, the traditional process has really, for a lot of organizations, when it's come time to do a major operating system update, has been to go through the process of doing a wipe and load. Now, with a wipe and load, the way that we should be doing that is we capture the data in the settings, so some organizations may do a full PC backup, so they've got the ability to do, do a restore just in case anything goes wrong. But if you just capture the user data in the settings, you can deploy the new operating system, you can inject the appropriate drivers, you can go through, you can install the apps, or you may have the apps deployed as part of the image, and then you can restore the user data in the user settings. Now, as you can imagine with this, um, it's something that can take a fair bit of time on a per machine basis because if we're going through and effectively reinstalling all of the applications or if we are laying down a very large image with all of the applications required pre-installed that's a quite a bit of um, storage that uh, needs to be uh, placed down on the hard drive it can be quite a bit of network traffic depending on uh, whether you're doing it through local storage or across the network now this is definitely a supported scenario uh, from Microsoft's perspective but what you've started seeing with Windows 10, though, is Microsoft has been putting a big emphasis on going through the process of doing an in-place upgrade. So with the in-place upgrade, this is where you let Windows do the work. So in this case, it's a very different upgrade process for those of you who are used to the way Windows used to do upgrades, where it was effectively laying the new version of the operating system over the top. But what it does here is it actually lays down a new operating system and transfers the settings, files, etc., from the and applications from the previous version onto the new one. So you've you've seen variations of the way this works for the last few versions of Windows. So you've seen things such as the uh, Windows.old folder, which gives you an idea that this is the type of approach that's taken taking place. Now, what's really important with this one is that this is probably the one that's had the most in-field testing as of this point in time, because all of those machines that are getting delivered their free upgrade via the internet via Windows Update, that's all of those users are receiving an in-place upgrade. So that means that, you know, we're talking over 100 million machines have gone through this process. So from a reliability and a um, supportability perspective, it's something that Microsoft recommends strongly. Now the final option that we've got listed here is around the provisioning option. So this is where we, we can start using some of the new deployment tool options to go through and configure a new device that uh, we're taking off the shelf and just apply custom settings to that to overlay what's already there. So we can remove some things that we don't want there, we can add additional settings, uh, we can go through, add additional users, etc. to the device just through a simple uh, provisioning package. So this is something that is a new option here and it's really something to help design or to approach those scenarios where uh, in the past you may have done a rebuild uh, just to get it to the uh, level of OS that you wanted. But in this case, we can do things like move up from a lower edition of Windows to a higher edition of Windows, for example. So it starts really uh, giving you the ability to save some time and get more, de uh, more devices deployed faster. So I mentioned that the upgrade process is something that has been refined um, over the last few years. And if we take a look at this uh, example here, no pun intended, uh, it's all about you know thinking about the upgrade process as being more like an egg, where we've got the operating system sitting in the middle as an egg, and then around that we've got the data, the drivers, the settings, and the applications. So what this is trying to signify is that we can remove the yoke while leaving other things in place. So that means that if we need to swap the yoke out, we can do that. So this is one of the nice things about Windows becoming much more componentized and this approach around trying to keep the different user settings versus operating uh, system files separate from each other. So it ends up giving us a much smoother upgrade path. So 
what are the in-place upgrade options and what's the process that's involved? So it's supported with clients from Windows 7 upwards. And as I mentioned, consumers or people with home-based PCs, they can, do, uh, they can do it via Windows Update, but you can also grab the ISOs and do it manually as well. But what if you want to do it for a larger number of machines inside an organization? Well, at that point, you want to start looking at some of the different tools. So if you're working with a larger SMB customer and they've already got Configuration Manager deployed, uh, you may want to go down the Config Manager path, which I definitely recommend if they've already got it. But if it's someone who doesn't have a, an overall need for Config Manager and isn't looking at deploying it, you've also got the Microsoft Deployment Toolkit, which is available, which will help you go through and manage the process, automate some of the steps, and make it a lot easier for you to start doing things like pushing it out to a network share so that multiple people can install from once at network speed, or pushing out to a WDS server as well so that you can do the in-place upgrade across the, the network. So you've got a few different options that you can go through here. Now, some important things here is that you do need to use that standard Windows 10 image that's part of the, the ISO that you download. So you can't go through and customize that and add your own drivers, add your own images. That's something that you do after you've actually deployed the operating system or upgrade done the upgrade in place. So think of this as just doing a pure operating system upgrade and bringing everything across, and then you can make additional changes after the fact. So what's the process? Well, it's a fairly basic process. We start the upgrade process, whether manually or through an automated process, and we go through, and as I mentioned, we capture the data and settings, we move the existing OS into the windows.old folder, the new operating system is laid down into the windows folder, and then data and settings are restored, uh, and basically you're good to go. You've got a working uh, Windows 10 configuration. Now, the good thing about this upgrade process is that there are several points in it in which it, if during which it detects an issue, it can still roll back to that previous operating system. So it's a non-destructive upgrade, so you can roll back if anything goes wrong. You've also got a 30-day window after the initial installation to roll back if you need to. So if you start thinking about some of the Windows Server technologies to have running alongside this, uh, you may be thinking about things like uh, WSUS to make sure you're getting the latest versions of the drivers and the latest Windows 10 updates down. Uh, making sure you've got uh, you know, the sufficient bandwidth, you may have WDS uh, set up as well. So just making sure that your current Windows Server environment is in good shape, and that will make it a lot easier for you to go through and start deploying Windows 10. So why an in-place upgrade versus a refresh? Uh, so here it's really about, it's being, it's faster. So, you know, roughly 30 to 60 minutes on average to do an upgrade. It's smaller, so all you really need to push across the network is the original, uh, is the Windows ISO. So, you know, you're talking about, you know, roughly three to three and a half gigs of, um, you know, of traffic pushed across the network rather than a complete Windows install with all the apps, for example. Now, as I mentioned, it's been designed to have a very robust rollback on failure capability. And, you know, this is something that, um, you know, some of you may have seen machines where Windows 10 has discovered something during the upgrade process that it doesn't like and very smoothly rolls you back and allows you to sign back into your previous uh, operating systems. Now, there's no dependency on you having any kind of uh, develop, any kind of uh, deployment kit uh, components installed. It's something that you can, can just use the disk to do this. And in some cases, you know, you may just want to use this on some machines. In other scenarios, you may still want to go through the, uh, the, you know, the bare metal deployments if it's a new hard disk. You may want to go through the replace scenario for a machine that may be running XP or Vista and needs to be uh, replaced with a Windows 10 image. So these are all some of the things that you can, you know, you don't have to pick one method. You can pick and choose and use each where they're appropriate. Now, some of the things to be aware of that can be problematic uh, during the deployment process is, you know, making sure that if you're using a third-party disk encryption tool um, that you have gone through and you've seen what the ISV's recommendations are around that. Now, that's not something that is all that likely to affect uh, too many people in the SMB space. And the other thing there is to make sure that you know, it may not have full awareness of all of the applications that you've got installed. So if you're using an, a really old application or a custom application or an application that's not very well known, there's not a good chance that the Windows Update database is going to have a good understanding of what compatibility issues that application may have. So just make sure you're using something like the Application Compatibility Toolkit to test some of these things out in advance or to come up with remediation plans to deal with those. 
so if we take a look at what you do require to have in place for this in place upgrade to work well it's something where you have to think about really all you're doing is upgrading what's there you have to think carefully around if it's a scenario, scenario where you want to make some major changes uh, or even if they're not what you realize are major changes then you may need to go through and look for a fresh install instead and some of these changes that you need to be aware of is if you need to change from BIOS to UFI, if you want to change the disk layout if you're using a customized Windows PE build um, and you don't want to use the standard one well these are some of the things that you do need to have that um, you know you will need to look at doing a fresh deployment rather than an in-place upgrade now some of the other things on the oper operating system side is if you are looking at changing from 32-bit to 64-bit or changing the base language or changing the domain as well as a few others you know on the OS front they also would require an OS reinstall not an upgrade in place then the final thing here is is that this is not necessarily you know a showstopper but something to consider is if you decide that you also want to upgrade a whole bunch of the applications as well or you want to change a lot of the applications that are installed it may be faster and easier to build out a new image uh, using something like the MDT and then pushing that new image out with everything pre-installed and reconfigured and using tools like the user state migration tool to go through it through and export the user settings and files and then re-import them again after the process so you've got a few things to consider here but in a lot of cases for most people they won't be considering doing these things so just going through and doing that in, that in place upgrade is going to be a good option for them so if we just take a look now at a few of the different deployment options that are available we've got manual light touch and zero touch so with a manual install this is I guess the effectively the um, higher tech version of good old sneaker net so we've got ISO or USB based so you know a smaller network for example or this one I would really only recommend with standalone machines um, you know generally if they're on a network I'd always try to use some kind of network based approach so even if it's connecting to an ISO that's on a shared network location um, again knowing that if you're using Windows Server 2012 or 2012 R2 you can get some great performance enhancements here um, across all of the devices off your network if you are using server technologies like SMB multi-channel now as we move across to light touch this is where we start using the Microsoft deployment toolkit to go through and start doing um, you know we do a little bit of work in advance to make sure that we can get a good um, you know a good um, update process in place for these images and this is generally recommended for up to 250 devices which for most SMBs that's more than going to cover them and then the final one is the zero touch installation this is obviously only going to work for larger organizations who've already got system center configuration manager deployed but it means that they don't have to go out and touch any machine it can be all agent driven which will query config manager and make sure that it's pulling down the update when it's time to do the in-place upgrade so if we take a look at the different tools that I've already been mentioning and how they support Windows 10 well first of all let's take a look at it from a management perspective so for the larger enterprises System Center 2007 to the upcoming System Center Configuration Manager 2016 will all support the management of Windows 10 based machines. So if you're thinking about things like pushing out new packages, etc., so new applications, uh, this is something that all of these versions will support without a problem. A short, just as long as you've got the latest uh, requirements such as the hot fixes or the service packs as listed. Now when it comes to deploying Windows 10, what you'll see here is, is that everything from System Center 2012 onwards will support that as well as the Microsoft Deployment Toolkit 2013 Update 1. So as, I, as I've also mentioned, you know, you've got WDS in place, so that's also got the ability to deploy these images without any problem whatsoever. Now for the Windows Server compatibility, it works with all supported Windows Server versions. So effectively, from Windows Server 2008 upwards, they are uh, supported versions of Windows 10, oh, sorry, of Windows Server that Windows 10 will uh, cooperate with. So why not Windows Server 2003? Well, effectively, it's not a supported operating system. So no testing was really done to verify um, any level of functionality with that. So you've got WSUS, which will be, which has been updated to support Windows 10. Now, 
an important thing here, and this is something we'll do an update on in the future, is that there is also a Windows update for business coming along, which will be a cloud-based service that integrates with Windows 10's ability to do peer distribution of update packages, which will start reducing your dependency on WSUS uh, for managing Windows-based Windows 10-based PCs. So this is something that there should be more details of, uh, uh, hopefully by the time this uh, webcast is released. Uh, you should actually be able to see more information on this because it's something that is coming up very shortly. Now for Windows 10 group policy settings, you will need to download new ADMX files, so the group policy template files, and there's a link to this included in the uh, one of the blog sites that I'll mention at the end, the OEM, team blog, OEM Australia team blog site, so you'll be able to pull that information up there. Now the other thing here is something that I've already mentioned is, you know, WDS is a fantastic way to deploy new operating systems or to do upgrade images, for example. And this is something that you can see here that, uh, you know, WDS can support this. Now some of the things to be aware of is, you know, if you are applying security templates via the group policy, don't use the Windows 7 templates. Instead use WMI filters to check what version of the OS it is. If you're already working with group policy and multiple OS versions, you've probably already been doing some of this work, um, but just make sure that you go through and you test them and the end results are exactly what you expect. So now let's start moving on to some of the other pieces that we can start looking at as different ways of, you know, how can we get Windows 10 to interoperate with our existing environment? And one of the new things that's available is the ability to do an Azure Active Directory domain join. Now where this becomes important is for those of you who might be using something like Active Directory Connect or you may be using um, the uh, capabilities of Windows Server Essentials to push your user accounts um, up into Office 365 and Azure AD, for example. And what this means is that you can now start going through and you can use your on-prem credentials to sign into Azure AD. And what this is really a good target scenario for are devices that may need to come onto the network occasionally, but are generally devices that live outside of the network, but still need to connect into um, you know, Microsoft Online Services or other uh, software as a service based applications. But this is also something that you can use on premise. So if you've got an organization that for some reason has decided that they don't need a server on prem, it may only be two or three people, and they're looking at ways to start getting more control of these you know, unmanaged PCs, all of a sudden we can start joining them to Azure Active Directory to start getting some degree of management there. During the process where we do the Azure AD join, we can set local administrators very easily. Uh, we can start doing things like allowing devices or blocking devices. So if a user says they've misplaced a device, well, before we wipe it, we may just choose to block it to prevent it from accessing corporate uh, resources. Now, we can also go through and start automatically enrolling these devices into an MDM solution. Now, this is a, a, a preview technology at the moment that works with Microsoft's Intune capabilities, and I'll talk about that one next. And one of the things that we do start getting once we've got Azure Active Directory join set up here is we can start using our credentials, whether it's on-prem credentials or cloud-only credentials, to start getting single sign-on to things like Office 365, as well as over 2,500 different software as a service applications. So if you think about the different cloud services that your customer is using, such they may have things such as corporate uh, Facebook accounts or corporate Twitter accounts. It might be their online banking or their online um, accounting applications. These are things that can uh, yeah, can all be integrated with uh, different si single sign-on solutions such as uh, Azure Active Directory. And it means you sign into the machine, it authenticates against Azure AD, and then your credentials can then be used to start accessing other other resources, which is really a, a nice change over the versus the last few years where we've gotten to a point where passwords seem to have, usernames and passwords for people have started to grow again versus that simplicity that we had when everything was on-premise. Now, I mentioned that we've got the ability to also start doing mobile device management enrollment as part of this process. So in this case, um, it's still in preview and it's uh, leveraging the Microsoft Intune capability. And this means that instead of just doing the domain join, we can effectively now start pushing mobile device policies down to that device. So those policies might be things around password complexity. It could be around uh, things like app, apps that we push, want pushed down to the device, uh, other configuration settings that we need the device to have, uh, security policies. So 
it's very easy for us to go through and have this part of that simple process where the user enters their credentials and it automatically enrolls the device for them. So once those devices are enrolled, it means we can start seeing do they meet the compliance policies, we start getting reports that we can run, uh, we can get alerts as to what's going on on the machines. So it really starts giving us some good information about what's going on on these machines that are currently outside of the network. We can also start leveraging things like remote wipe capabilities, so it may be a complete wipe of the device, so a complete reset, or we may go through and say, look, we just want to do a selective wipe. We just want to wipe the corporate related information when someone leaves an organization as opposed to wiping the entire device and have them lose their uh, music collection, their photos and you know, a bunch of other things that they may not have backed up. So once we get this it means that we can work on-prem, we can work in remote locations and still get single sign-on capabilities to the Microsoft online services uh, but also as I mentioned we can keep you know we can keep working and get access to you know thousands of uh, single sign-on uh, enabled software as a service applications from third parties as well. So what's required to get this to work? Well if you want it to work with alongside your on-prem Active Directory environment I guess we need to add a couple of things onto this. We need to add that you do need to have Active Directory on-prem um, or or, and then you need to have some way of synchronizing that, whether it's through Windows Server Essentials capabilities or using one of the standalone directory synchronization tools. Uh, but you don't have to do that. You could just do it in a pure cloud environment, but that's not really the focus of, of this uh, session. So we need to have the appropriate Windows 10 client. We need to have Azure Active Directory, which every Office 365 user has already got. And if you don't have Office 365, this is something that you can get um, just by going to the Azure site and signing up and that this is something that there's a there is a free option available here for uh, everyone. Now we need to enable device registration and the optional piece is around that Intune or other MDM service so the Intune subscription isn't a requirement but it does definitely make some uh, major enhancements. So if we take a look at the requirements here we need Windows 10 Professional or Enterprise in order to do this. And if you want to sort of just have a quick understanding as to why they're required, well, if you think about Windows 10 Home, it can't join a domain, so it makes sense that it can't register against Azure Active Directory either. Uh, so you get some different experiences depending on um, whether you're using Pro or Enterprise when you do the sign up, and I'll walk through those in just a moment. Uh, but if you're using a consumer SKU, you've still got the option to go through and use um, something like your Microsoft account to sign into that device as well. So if we walk through the process of a brand new Windows 10 machine that's network connected that the user hasn't signed into, as they go through that sign up or the initial setup process, they get presented with the screen who owns this PC, at which point you choose my organization or I do. Now, this is what a pro user will get. An enterprise user won't see this screen. Instead, if it's an enterprise license, it works on the assumption that it's actually a business machine to begin with. And what we then get is the option to either join as your Active Directory or to join a domain. Now, once I choose join as your AD, it says, well, supply your work or school account. So it talks about sign in with the username and password you use with Office 365 or other business services from Microsoft. So if we're using one of the different synchronization options from Microsoft, this should be the same username and the same password that we're using on premise. And then once we sign in, that will just go through and basically then take us to the login screen where we can sign in as ourselves and start having our corporate policies pushed down to that device. Now, depending on whether we use Intune or not, that will determine the level of policies that we can start pushing down versus just a basic domain join. But if we take a look here, Intune has been updated recently to include uh, things such as uh, a, a bunch of additional configuration uh, capabilities here. So we've got the uh, general configuration settings, there's the uh, VPN settings for Windows 10, there's uh, yeah, certificate settings for Windows 10 as well. So these are things where now there are default templates built into, um, into Microsoft Intune to actually support some of these scenarios for you. Now that brings us to an end for the Windows 10 related content in this update. So we'll just talk about some of the upcoming events that we've got. So there is the uh, Microsoft Ignite event happening on the Gold Coast November 17 to 20. 
there's a series of one-day modern business events running around the country starting in November. So there's Connect with Customers, which will be focused on CRM online, Safeguard Your Business, which will be focused on a variety of different um, security technologies in Windows 10, Windows Server, and uh, cloud services. There'll be Grow Efficiently and Business Anywhere events, both running in the January and February timeframes of next year. And there's also some Windows 10 one-day training that's also coming up, just waiting on some final updates based on some of the changes that occurring with uh, the, uh, the latest updates to Windows 10 that are coming through and then we'll be able to get those delivered to you as well. Now from a resources perspective the main ones we've got available are the Smart HQ site so I'm guessing if you're watching this video you're probably already a Smart HQ member and you are already you already do have the ability to go through and sign in but this is where you need to go to get like sales information marketing information and a whole bunch more around uh, Microsoft technologies for the reseller and system builder space now We've also got the Microsoft Australia OEM team blog site. So this is where the content is primarily you know, more, more, more technical in nature in general, but also just trying to sort of keep you abreast of you know, any events or any major news items that uh, are important for those of you who do work in the service space uh, with OEM products. And then finally, we do have the pre-sales information uh, email alias, so oemserverau at microsoft.com. So if you do have any uh, requests around you know, pre-sales information on OEM server products, uh, this is the email address that you can reach us on. So with that, I'd like to thank you for listening and watching today's uh, recording. And if you do have any questions, you've got three different ways there to get a hold of us. And uh, if there are particular topics you'd like us to cover in the future, uh, reach out and let us know because we're always looking for new things to cover to make sure you've got the information that you need. So thank you again for your time and look forward to you joining us next month.